this already? No. All right. Um, Charles II promised that he that the Scots. You see, he, Charles II had been crowned in Scotland. The moment his father, Charles I, was executed in 1650 by Oliver Cromwell by Parliament, Charles II came to well, he came to Scotland. He was crowned at Spoon Palace, and then he immediately went into exile during the years of the parliamentarian government. So Oliver Cromwell ruled Parliament down in London until he died in 1660. Now when he died, there was nobody in that MP coterie that wanted to take over the ruling of the country. They all said, no, 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 not me, not me. Well, somebody had to be the leader. Charles II was already crowned in years earlier. He was living over in France. He was a king in waiting. So by the way, we have a king, let's go get him. So they went over, they got him, they brought him back to London. They had this great, glorious celebration and coronation, creating great crown jewels for him, because Oliver Cromwell had melted down all the English crown jewels during his 10-year period in charge. And Charles II was crowned officially in England. Now remember, he'd already been king in Scotland for 10 years. But the period of his reign is known as the restoration of the monarchy. And it was a new monarchy. This is a period of time when Parliament says, OK, we'll have you back as king, but we're going to put some rules on this, some restraints. No longer are you going to be a king that can just do anything you want. We're going to say what your limits are. You will be a constitutional monarchy. So that's when that changes, 1660. So, the Scots were delighted. This is the man they had backed. He had promised them, you can have any faith you want, worship any way you want, uh, I'm behind it 100%. Well, my goodness, it wasn't but four years into his reign when suddenly he did the same thing his father had done. Sitting in London one day, thinking, oh, wait a minute, I don't get this. I'm head of the Church of England. Why am I not also head of the Church? the same question that had vexed his father. And so once again, St. Giles becomes a cathedral. The bishop is installed, the order of service is insisted on, it's an Anglican church. Well, the Scots are happy about this. 1660s, that covenanting fervor is reignited, and it actually gets worse. And so the Scots, who had already authorized this fabulous act of Charles II, on a horse, wearing the, the garments of a Caesar. I mean, he's riding out, behind St. Giles Cathedral, by the way, or the High Kirk, he's riding out in all his glory. Well, the Scots were not happy at all. And so they changed the statue. It's kind of like that 13th fairy in the story of um, Sleeping Beauty. She got to cancel the spell just a wee bit. Well, that's what the Scots did. The statue wasn't quite finished. So they added a face on the back, between the shoulder blades of Charles II. This is known as the two-faced statue of Charles II. But there's an even funnier story about this statue that I'd like to tell you about. It is the largest and the oldest, biggest equestrian statue in the whole of the UK. It was made by Grinling Gibbons, who's famous for his beautiful wood carvings in the lovely houses of the 17th century. Um, it is a beautiful statue, but it is made of lead. And the good people of Edinburgh were so in love with their statue that they decorated it on multiple occasions. They decorated it with garlands of wonderful leaves and flowers and, and plants that had pokey bits, pokey stems and pokey thistles, pokey thorns. And those pokey bits poked through the lead. And eventually, by the mid-1800s, the statue had become rather pervious to our weather. So the rain was seeping in. And before long, by the end of the 1800s, well, about the 1870s, um, the horse was full of water. Now, when a horse is full of water, he tends to bend a bit if he's made of lead. And that's just what he did. He went down on one foot, one knee. Um, the people were horrified. We've got to do something about this. So they called in, called in the, the statue repair people, and they, they got him up. They reinforced his legs. He's just been redone, by the way, again. But anyway, back in the 1800s, they fixed him up, 
and then they had to get the water out of the horse. Now, how do you get water out of the body of a horse? You drill a hole. Where do you drill the hole? Absolutely. Well, they did drill that hole, and for the next two weeks that horse peed. <laughs> now, you have to remember that this is during the Victorian period. Everything very prim and proper, and you can't have a peeing horse in public. Not in our beautiful Parliament Square. No, no. Heaven forbid. So they erected a privacy screen around <laughs> the horse so that people couldn't see the peeing horse. But the wives of the men of the court, the lords, they went up to the balcony and they watched from above. <laughs> He's just been read